Okay, hi May. Welcome to um, We Speak Loud podcast. I'm the host of this podcast, and basically, this podcast is an is opportunity for um, everyone to be able to have a voice and and find their find their voice and, and share their story. And that's my mission that I want to um, continue continue this journey of discovering people's stories and and know where the, everyone comes from. So that's why I started this podcast. Great. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. Of course. So um, you, you mentioned that you want to lo- know a little bit where I'm from? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm from San Francisco, California. I was born and raised here. And for most of my life, like I had a hard time fitting in because of my skin color. It's different from Chinese American. Because I'm Chinese American, I don't look Chinese American, so everyone thought like I was mixed, Filipino, um, even Hispanic, and every other Asian except for Chinese. And so I, for the longest time, I lost my identity growing up as a child. And I'm not sure if that's the same for you, but um, could you tell me a little bit, a little bit about your childhood? Oh, sure, I'd be happy to. So. Um, I was born in Hong Kong and came to the U.S. when I was eight months old. Uh, Grew up in Brooklyn, New York, lived there until I was 25, Um, and then moved to San Francisco. I actually lived there for six years, got married. Um, We had our daughter, and she's half Chinese and half Irish. Um, And then we went to live in Japan for about five and a half years uh, because of my job. I was teaching English at a graduate school. And then when we came back to the U.S., we lived in um, Seattle for 14 years. And then when our daughter graduated from high school and went off to college, we thought, we don't have to be in Seattle anymore. Where do we want to go? And so the Bay Area called us back down. Uh, And then we've been uh, living in the Bay Area since 2013. And then now we are in the process of actually moving to Valencia, Spain. And my husband's already there. He has been there since November 1st. And uh, I spent the month of November in Portland, Oregon, with one of my sisters and her family. And then now I'm uh, in New York for the month of December, visiting family and friends, all of whom I haven't seen since the pandemic. And then I will be uh, traveling to Valencia, Spain um, in early January. So that's really awesome. Like, like, Like you lived in so many different cities. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Like, so tell me, you know, how has the pandemic um, affected your connection with your family members, even, even your friends? Sure. Um, the pandemic really affected um, my being able to see family member and friends because a lot of us were taking it very seriously. You know, we especially when nobody knew what was happening. Um, and so we were very careful to make sure we we're isolating, wearing masks, getting our vaccines, you know, trying to uh, practice good health hygiene. And um, it's, I mean, it has affected us as it has affected a lot of people, you know, a lot of, um, um, a lot of us working from home um, instead of at the office. I have been very privileged to be working at the East Bay Community Foundation. Um, and so I, my team was in charge of the processing of money that came in the door and then the grant money that went out the door. So during the pandemic, I actually would go into the office once a week, print up the grant award letters, the CFO would give me the grant checks and I would take them home. And then the next night, uh, my husband and I would sit around the table and that was our date night. And we would sit there and stuff grant awards with checks and mail them out the door. So we actually got to see money moving out into the community during the pandemic. So that was a very interesting and very rewarding experience. And so, yeah, that, that's really amazing that you um, were able to do that during, during the pandemic. And yeah, a lot of us has been affected by the pandemic and where we're so isolated, we don't talk anymore. And that's part of the reason why I'm starting the podcast too, because I feel like a lot of us are kind of closed off a little bit and and then we don't share enough about our culture. And then we start to have this assumption about the culture. And I I actually um, 
Last month, I put together a multicultural event with mm -hmm. all my friends, and we all discuss of our culture. Even though, like, you, you might be living in North or South Vietnam or even Northern Southern California, is completely different, and and so it's nice to learn about where everyone comes from. Like, even though you're from the same state or country, everything is different. It's, oh, it is. It's like the region is different. So so it's like, even the dialect is different. So it's mm -hmm. interesting to just learn how people grew up in, in, in their culture and in their family too. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I'm really interested in, in your covering this because as someone who grew up in the U.S. as an immigrant, you know, part of an immigrant family, and then raising our daughter um, my experience has been very different from hers um, a lot of it in terms of for me growing up with a lot of um, traditional Chinese cultural values that my uh, parents basically taught us as we were growing up I know when I was much younger a term and phrase that I used to hear a lot is the Cantonese was spoken in my family and the phrase mo yong, which means not worth anything. So when if ever I was disobedient, I heard that word a lot. And I also was raised um, as the oldest Chinese daughter to always take care of everybody else, not make any waves, not ask any questions. So for me growing up, my voice was not something that I actually had and could really use or nor was I really encouraged to use it and it really wasn't until um, I was actually in my 40s and I was taking an ex I was participating in an executive training program that I during this program realized that um, I'm a writer and so I would silence myself in my writing in my head and it was during this program that I basically gave myself permission to write garbage and because I broke down that barrier, it really helped me with freeing up being able to write. Um, and so when I was raising my daughter, it was very important to me when she was younger that I not use that phrase with her and that I really wanted her to have a voice, especially when she was a young child. Um, so that was something that I really encouraged. Um, and um, I mean, we would let her wear whatever clothes she wanted, even though <laughs> they had stains all over them. I mean, she would pick out her clothing and things like that. And so to me, it was very, very important to encourage that in her. Uh, maybe I didn't catch it. What phrase did, did you use again? It's uh, the Chinese phrase is uh, in Cantonese, Mo Yong. Oh yeah, I heard that a lot of times when I was when I was a kid. Okay. My parents always said that all the time, and then they they, they even say "inga de kam chunga." Why so stupid? It's like mm -hmm. I struggled a lot in school, so I you know I was a slow learner. Mm -hmm. But last year I discovered discovered that I have ADHD, mm. which makes sense why it takes me so long to get my homework done and yeah and like and i don't really do well in tests either because i think my brain isn't engaged in it to yeah. even pay attention to what i'm learning and yeah. so they're always help, telling me like oh why are you so stupid you can't do simple math and then my dad would, would be really mean sometimes mm -hmm. he'd be like you went to college and you to learn english and you don't know english I was like, uh, when I think about it now, it's like, it's really hard. It's like, you, you guys don't know, they, they don't know English. And so I, my Chinese is only so much that, that, that I know. And how yeah. to translate this word into into Chinese is mm -hmm. difficult because there's sometimes there's no definition for it. Right, right. Yeah, there's no direct translation. And the other thing, too, is I, I'm like you. I'm very similar. I don't do well on standardized tests. I mean, I hate standardized tests. And for me, as an educator, um, I used to teach ESL, English as a second language here in the States as well. Um, that is just something that I have always kind of pushed against. Um, I'm glad to see colleges or you know, thinking twice now about the SATs and, and other standardized tests. And that, that to me, that it doesn't really, it doesn't test you other than testing how good 
a standard test taker you are. That's all it is. It's not really showing any of your knowledge or ability. And I'm really glad that you finally got diagnosed because, you know, all the struggles that you had when you were younger, um, that's all real. You know, and, and that really, really affects how you move through life and, and the support you get or lack of support. I mean, all of that is really important. Um, getting the right support, getting the right diagnosis, having that acknowledgement that, um, you know, whether you have a barrier or whether you need to learn um, and get help with different techniques or ways to read or, you know, do things, that's so super important. Yeah, it is. Like, I didn't have a lot of support growing up, so <laughs> I also was diagnosed with learned disability, but now I'm thinking maybe it's not learned disability, maybe it's the ADHD. Mostly mm. that, that was the most um, prominent issue that I had was ADHD. Mm. Um, learning disability, you know, it's like, yeah, I, I, I learned things a little slow, but that could be my ADHD issue. Mm-hmm. But growing up... Um, I worked really hard in school because I wanted to prove my parents that I'm not Mo Young, <laughs> that yeah. I'm smart. And so, like, I try to prove to my parents that I'm smart, but mm-hmm. is, I guess, their way of thinking smart is like, it's different from what I'm thinking how smart is supposed to look like. Because smart to me is just like, oh, you're, you're just smart, you're just really, but intelligent is different. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. very different that. yeah very different well I just yeah. that I'm actually intelligent like I can think you know not not just like being smart at something but I know how to be intelligent and be able to explain things to people and recently like people have told me like oh you have really great insights you have really great things to say and that to me is intelligent and not, yeah. not smart um yeah. so I guess my parents don't know the difference between intelligent and smart it, it is mm-hmm. like, oh like if a kid goes to you know stanford or um harvard oh they're smart they're geniuses but intelligent goes a long way yeah yeah the you know it's so interesting you bring that up because um i know one of the things i would imagine you experience this as well as someone growing up in an immigrant and asian household here in the u.s is um, people like to talk about getting to Stanford and Harvard and the Ivy League schools. And that that is that is an accomplishment in itself. And I, I won't take that accomplishment away from people who do get in. However, one of the things I really did appreciate when my daughter was in high school and there was a college counselor um, as part of the high school staff. And something that she said to me, I wished I wish that a lot of parents really understood. In the U.S. alone, there are over 3,000 institutes of higher education learning for, for, for students to go through. And it's not all about just getting into the Ivy Leagues um, or a certain school. I mean, there, with knowing that there are three, over 3,000 institutions of higher education, that means there's most likely going to be some kind of program for their child going, you know, as, as they get older. And part of, I think, the, our, the, my, I'll just talk about my own upbringing of my parents, yeah, pushing us and wanting us to do well, but then at the same time, disciplining us in this um, kind of psychological way of, you know, if, if you don't meet my expectations, you're mo young, right? You know, you're not worth anything and I remembered at one point complaining to my mother saying that my dad was in the restaurant business and um, I had complained at one point saying oh you just want my brother and I to go into the restaurant business and then my mother said to me if we just wanted you to go into the restaurant business why do you think we're encouraging you to go to college right so it just was this very interesting way of um, I think for our parents not being taught how to talk to your kids in a supportive way that it's kind of like this discipline approach um and whether it's kind of hardline or kind of trying to scare your kids or trying to you know bully them or 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 be mean about it i mean i know it comes from a place of love 
but there's a big gap between um, showing your love um, in one way or the other. And I think I think that's what I have struggled with. I mean, there there are lots of ways that they they did show that they love me, and they do, you know, they did. Um, and so both my parents have passed away. Um, but I also know that there are were many struggles that I had with them growing up, you know, to, to become my own adult. Yeah, I had the similar issues, like the way they parent us is like discipline. Mm-hmm. And, and then you just wonder like, oh, how come like, you know, we don't get that kind of love that we want. And we're, it's like we watch a lot of, I don't know about you, but I watched a lot of TV shows growing up about families and full mm-hmm. shows and family matters, and and I'm like I'm jealous. Like I wish my wish wish I was like that kid, even even though it's on TV. But yeah, it, it rep- represents a lot of, of the kids that were born here, mm-hmm. um, and not have and not like not in the immigrant family. Yeah. And so, like, I keep hearing the word grounded or hear my friends tell me, oh, I got gr- I'm grounded for like a week. And then I yeah. I kind of laugh about it. I was like, I, I never got grounded. But then I think about it, I was like, oh, I get disciplined. Right. Which is like, I kind of want to go back and like take that back and not laugh that, that like they, my friends got grounded. I'd rather mm-hmm. say like, because I, because I, like, it's not funny because I'd rather be grounded than disciplined. Yeah. 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 I remember um, a, a relative of mine had talked to me about um, um, when they had gone to college and then they would go to a roommate's home for Thanksgiving break or, you know, one of the holidays. They, they didn't have enough money to come home for the holidays. And I remember they had said to me, you know, at my roommate's place, the mother's a doctor, the father's a lawyer, and they sit around and they have conversations at at dinner time. Um, and and they really they wish that we had had that growing up. And I remembered saying to this relative, saying that you know, I get that and I understand that. And maybe when you graduate from college and and you become a professional and you end up partnering finding someone else who is a professional you can do that with your kids and i i did i did want to remind that person that you know our parents don't have that college education and i feel like when you have when you're more educated in general you learn how to you have more choices available to you in life um, that's something that I've always been very conscious of teaching my daughter as she was growing up, like having choices. Because to me, if you can put yourself in a situation where you have more choices, then you're empowered to choose. Now, you might not always make the right choice, um, but that's where you learn. Um, but I had pointed out that uh, that our parents were immigrants and they, a lot of, I think, the parents of my generation maybe they had a high school education some of them didn't Um, I know my mom had a high school education I think my dad had a junior high school education and I think I had said to my relative that um you know I'm really proud of how hard our parents have worked to kind of basically you know be able to own a home and and be able to, to try to raise their four kids in the U.S. Um, and so it's, it's funny because, you know, when you talk about hearing friends being grounded versus being disciplined, sometimes it it does look nicer on the other side. And then other times there, there are kind of, it becomes a strength that makes you who you are as well. Right. Like, like, you know, for yourself, um, maybe if you decide to have kids one of these days or maybe with nieces and nephews that you wouldn't want to discipline them in the way that you were disciplined um you know or maybe encourage friends who have kids like to be aware of that and I, and I think that um it is something that it's hard right you know it's hard especially when you're growing up and you're the child being heard and being disciplined like not being able to understand where that's coming from yeah totally I totally um agree with you and you know 
I think that we're all related somehow. Like we might have different experiences and stories, but、mm-hmm. it's always pretty much similar in some ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What What have you found?、Um, you know, in talking to different people, has that's been the the most basic common thread? And and like, are there any tips that you have found and learned from other people? Um, I'm not sure about tips, but what I discovered is that、um, a lot of us, it's it's just how, like our parents, you know, upbringings, you know, and I talked to lots girl that I talked to, she was very similar to me in a way,、mm-hmm. and her mom, she described her mom as very. Um, very like extrovert,、mm-hmm. and then she's introvert, and、yeah. that too. Like I'm, a, my mom, my parents are extrovert, and I'm introvert.、Mm-hmm. And then I talked to one one another person. He he said that he had depression, and we so we had a discussion about mental health. And then he he was told that he had depression, and then. I and then I was told I had anxiety, but we both didn't know how that. Like we're like we don't have to. We're not depressed. We're not in yeah anxiety, but we actually don't know like because we don't well we don't know what we don't know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and so I feel like a lot of people probably have depression or anxiety, but they're not sure that they even have it or not. Yeah,、and、I'm sure my parents have it because even though like they don't say it, but. But it's it's not like the depression where they it's just like they, they just don't do anything.、Mm-hmm. Depression,、mm-hmm. it's more like you know there's something there but you're not happy about, but you、yeah. don't express it. But you just、yeah. know you're not happy. I, I see that's depression.、Mm-hmm. Even though my parents are like, oh, we, we have to take care of the family, but still they can still be depressed even though they're taking care of the family, and you don't really notice that. They're depressed. Exactly. Yeah. So,、um, so my mom passed away when I was very young. I was 22 at the time, and I remember、um, going to see a therapist, and it was the best thing that I could do. And I remembered having conversation with, like, my brother and my dad were incredulous. You know, how could I go to a stranger and talk to them about family things? And I remembered saying to my brother, you know.、Uh, A therapist is the best thing that I can do because they're they are trained to help me, and then not only that, but、um, you know when you go through something as traumatic as someone de- you know close to you dying like that,、um, it brings up a lot of things. The other thing too is that I grew up in a household with domestic violence as well, so that was another layer、um, to go in the, in there, and so. Seeing a therapist was wonderful because my therapist, as I mentioned, you know, they're trained to help you, and she had identified that I was actually depressed, and that I most likely was depressed throughout high school. And I remember being shocked about it, thinking, like, you know, how can I be depressed when I would be get up, getting up out of bed every day, right? And 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 I didn't. I think I didn't exhibit what I would have felt or the stereotypical stories around depression. You know, like okay, I had imagined maybe the definition of depression is、um, I couldn't get out of bed or I couldn't do this or that. And and granted, some for some people that is what they they go through.、Um, but yeah, it was very very interesting. And so I think, and I think I would agree with you. I, I'm pretty sure that my parents have probably gone through different、um, phases of depression. Um, if not for a good part of their lives, all of their lives,、um, and and it's something that to me is just it's this international thing. It, you know, depression doesn't care what nationality you are. Depression doesn't really care what age and what sex and you know whether you're binary or non-binary. I mean, it's just it it is something that is very important to acknowledge and to to get support and treatment for. Yeah, it, it's interesting you said that. Like depression. You know, doesn't see color or races or anything like that.、Yeah. Everyone can experience depression. I feel like even animals can too. Like、mm-hmm. when you know, like my dog was depressed for two weeks when when our other dog 
passed away. And oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, even though even though yeah. he she left, like my brother took her back to Los Angeles. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And then he stopped bothering her when, he, when she came back for like that week. She he stopped bothering her. He stopped going near her. It's like he suspected something was going on with her, mm-hmm. and then, and then the minute she left, like he kind of knew, like she was she she had no more. She she wasn't gonna live any longer because he was sad for like two weeks after um, she left, and then and then when she left the first time, because like, my brother took her back um, the first time, and he was a he was sad for like two or three weeks. Oh sure, yeah. yeah. Well, I can, I, I I mean. Animals do feel they they have a lot of feelings, and and especially when you have pets, you can definitely you can definitely tell, and they 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 sense a lot more. I mean, when you think about like the fact that some dogs can smell cancer, um, you know, they there are many senses that they have that we just don't understand, um, and I'm sure feelings are that's included in there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, um, since you, you kind of described a little bit about your parents, but can you describe a little bit more about them? Like, how are they like? Sure. Um, my parents um, were both, I think, yeah, they were born, I think, in the Guangdong area, province of China, and then they met in Hong Kong. Um, they came over to the U.S., my mother must have been in her mid twenties. Uh, my dad, a few years older than her, um, so came and we stayed with. Uh, I think one of my my dad's oldest uh, sister and auntie in Queens, and then we my parents were able to save up and get a laundromat in Jackson Heights, Queens, and so there was a lot of struggle during that time. And I think you know when you when you look at people who are abusive. Um, it's more about power or, or control, control or lack of control. And um, the idea that you take it out on those that are closest to you. Um, and so that that had a lot of effect on us growing up as kids. Um, and so for the for us, I'm, I'm kind of happy to say that we my siblings and I have been able to kind of break that cycle in the partners that we chose. And so, but it is something that really affects you growing up. So number one, not having confidence in using your voice. And then the whole idea of authority when you're growing up and that fear of authority. Um, It's funny because I, I know recently I've been reading about, there seems to be in general two schools of thought. One school of thought is that, you know, as you grow older, you grow into the person that you become. Um, You know, the other school of thought is you're already born the person that you are. Um, And it's just a matter of recognizing that when you get older. And then nurture and nature has a lot to do with that. So I was telling my um, little brother the story of when I was in the laundromat. And I remembered one time I was, I must have been younger than five. And the kids in the school, in the neighborhood said, oh, we're going to go to the the park to the sprinklers. Do you want to come? Go ask your mom. And I remembered asking my mom and she said, no, you can't go. And I then I, of course, what did I do? I went to the kids and I said, oh, my mom said I can go. And so, of course, I went. And then when I got back, I, I was in big trouble, right? Because I lied to my mom and I lied to everybody else. And so I definitely got the the end of the hanger, you know, in terms of being hit. And so I was I was laughing about this story because I was saying to my little brother, I think I've always known that I was like a rebel one way or the other or or rebellious um but at the same time and i i think i see a little bit of that now when i think about it i see a little bit of that in my daughter as well and i'm kind of proud of that in, in her um but it definitely was very hard growing up especially as a um a female in an asian family because i i have another friend who wrote <clears throat> she was writing a story And she wrote something very powerful. I'm paraphrasing it because I can't remember exactly the sentence. She said something about when you are born a girl, you're born guilty. Because you're born guilty not being a boy. And that, when I read that, that she 
the sentence that she said and and like i said i feel like i'm not doing it enough justice that really hit me deeply that was so profound it was something that i had never thought about um and so i feel like for women we face almost like double the hardship right because we're number one we're not boys and number two there we have value we have value and we have voice that should be valued and you know the more for especially for younger girls hearing this and seeing it whether it's in the media or whether it's in podcasts you know like the one that you're doing i think is very very important because it, that's that's how we start to change you know and and make it a little bit easier um but yeah so that's kind of the um a little bit about my parents and at the same time i think my parents um I think we're proud of me and and my siblings in some ways. I, I know at one point in time, um, I, before my mom died, it was very important for me to let her know who I was. And I was dating someone who was not Chinese. And I remember I was very, very nervous saying that to my parents. Um, you know, and I remembered, I think an uncle came to visit. And so I had my uncle help me tell my parents because I, I needed that support. And so, um, you know, they weren't really happy, but at the same time, I think they really appreciated the fact that I said that um, and I and I let them know. Um, but it, it does take, I don't think I could have said it to them by myself, I'm, but I, I did have an uncle who was willing to help me say that to them. So I think it's very important that if there's something that, you know, someone has a hard time wanting to say to their parents or a loved one that by all means bring somebody with you and, and have them help you, you know, have them help you that bridge. Yeah, totally. Like when you have another family or friend to support you, it goes a long way. And, yeah. You know, I was very nervous telling my parents that I'm dating someone who is black. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then and I was so nervous. I showed him the picture to my parents. I'm dating this guy. And then they said he was good looking though. And then he met like once. And then he was yeah. like, he's very good looking. My aunt was like, oh, I'm drooling because he's so good looking. And then, um, <laughs> but I was like so nervous telling them like he's black. Sure. You no. Know? Yeah. It's, it's so out of like the Asian norm, like the Asian, mm-hmm. date Asians or date um, white and that's it. Yeah. Asians don't like date anyone, any other ethnicity outside mm-hmm. of the race or, or like just white. Yeah. And yeah. so telling my, my mom that like, hey, I'm dating someone who's black is totally, was kind of scary because I, I don't know how she was, she's going to react to that. Sure. Sure. What was, what was your biggest fear going into that conversation? My biggest fear is that my mom is very judgmental. Yeah. And it, I feel like she's, I forgot what that word is called, um, when someone only likes just their own race or something. Mm-hmm. I forgot what that word was called. It's, but. it's. I would say it's bigotry or xenophobia. There, there must be another word. Maybe, maybe there's another word you're thinking of, but those are the first two words that come to my mind. Yeah, something like that. And yeah. she's not very, like, kind and generous and I think it's maybe because she was born in in the commerce era in China and so there's a lot of things probably taking from her yeah and like she probably got abused a lot during that Mm -hmm. time Mm -hmm. Um, so I don't know what went went wrong she won't say anything but I'm guessing it's something like traumatized her probably yeah yeah I would imagine that so it's interesting so my daughter my dad um, passed away in 2014, so it's been eight years since he passed away. And just before he passed away, um, my daughter had come out to us, <clears throat> and she was dating uh, somebody from um, her college who they this year got engaged, and so we're thrilled they're going to be getting married in a couple of years. And I remember I was very happy to share it with the rest of the family. My dad was, he had had a sudden illness um, where he had to, he was in the ICU. And I remember going to Brooklyn to visit family and go to come back and visit him. 
Um, and I made it a point to tell everybody else, but not to tell my dad. And the reason why I didn't tell my dad was I didn't want my, and I think it, it really honestly was like my own fear. I didn't want my dad's relationship with my daughter for him to, for if he had any homophobic feelings for that to come out because I thought I had a feeling it was very serious and, and, um, I wanted to, if he did die, which, which he did soon later on, that he at least had good thoughts about my daughter rather than not. And, you know, I don't know how I feel about that. I felt like at the time as a parent, that was my decision that I made. Um, and, and she, and I talked to my daughter too. I mean, I let her know. And she at that time was fine. And in fact, in fact, when we're done with this interview later on, I'll ask her, you know, looking back, like, how does she feel about it? Because I think it's important for me to know how she felt about it. But it was very interesting because I felt like my dad was of a generation where, I mean, he was getting to the end of his life. He's not going to change. Maybe he would have been open to her, but maybe not. And it was something that I just didn't want to take the chance on. And, and, you know, I could, you could say I didn't have faith in my father. You could say that I had fear of maybe him judging me. Um, and that could have been it, but it was really more of like, I wasn't, I'm not really afraid of my dad because <laughs> at one point, um, after my mom had passed away, we, we had a phone conversation and that that's kind of one of the milestones in my life when I was kind of able to feel like I'd become an adult. So we were, we were arguing about something and I had said to him, I finally said, you know, dad, you're the reason why mom died. Um, you're the, and, and he's, he's like, what are you talking about? And I said, because you beat her. She didn't have, her body wasn't strong enough to fight the cancer. And he said, you can't say that to me and hung up the phone. And I know there was a period when we didn't talk, but then when we did talk again, what was interesting was one of my siblings noticed that he treated me with more respect. And I think because I finally stood up to him, I mean, like what person wants to hear, you know, that you caused your, your wife or your husband to die, right? Like, especially by your kid, like that was like the most awful thing I could ever say to him. And at the same time, I think what my dad also understood was because I kept talking to him, it's, it's not like I had that fight and then I never talked to him again. I think my dad still understood that I loved him, even though he did these terrible things. Um, and at the same time, I was willing to say that that he did these terrible things. Um, and that was a very painful time, I think, for I think for him to hear and for me to say. But at the same time, I feel like I'm very proud of the fact that I said that to him. Um, and I think, you know, it's something that we're not taught. You know, lots of times we're taught, don't say anything to your parent that questions their authority, right? Don't, don't say anything to your parent that makes them feel accountable for what they did. But to me, I think for my values, I think this was the voice that I wanted to um, say this was a voice that I wanted to use, um, and I and I I don't know how many other people share stories like that. Um, you know, I'm hoping that by sharing this story with you, that like it inspires people who are listening to say like, okay, if I need to say something <laughs> hard to my parents, that maybe maybe they'll find the courage to do that. Yeah, it's like it's thank you for sharing that and. Yeah, I think that people will be, lost people will be inspired by your share. Um, be, just because, like, we don't know what goes, goes on in the family. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of times, like, I feel like, you know, like my parents, they see a family family that's like, oh, yeah, they're so lucky. They're, they're, they have a nice car, nice home. Oh, yeah. yeah. Nice. And then it starts comparing, like, we have nothing, we're poor. And I'm just like, you can't compare like that. I keep trying to tell my dad, like, you have to look at, like, 
yes, they might have nice car, nice homes, and their kids probably went to, you know, like a Ivy League school or whatnot, but it doesn't mean that their family is a happy camper. Yeah. 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 That going on the family that you don't even know. And mm -hmm. you just can't compare because people pro probably buy expensive stuff just to hide or cover whatever yeah. in their family. Like, so mm -hmm. you don't really know if, are they really rich or are they covering it up? We don't know. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of it has to do with saving face. It's really interesting because I remembered reading or hearing some stories on NPR you know not just about asian families but families in the u.s in general about how some families would yeah they would have the fancy car in the house but then when you took a look at like how much they owed in credit card debt it was very very high you know versus somebody not having like the best car i mean our we're a family that believes in used cars we've always bought secondhand cars we've never bought a new car um, and we did fine. You know, I mean, the car drove us to where we needed to get to until it broke down. And then after that, we would get a new one, a new used one. Um, but it's, it's, yeah, it's, you're right. I think, I think what you say is very, so true and so important to remember, like, we don't know what's going behind, going on behind closed doors. We don't know what's, you know, going on behind the scenes. And um, I think that that's something that, you know, especially the whole idea, I think, of saving face, right? You know, and wanting be, to be able to be proud about bragging about what your kids are doing or what your family is doing or what your friends are doing. I mean, some of that is really good. But at the same time, I think when we do that, we then start to raise um, unrealistic expectations because then, then it becomes, you know, this comparison thing. And so, you know, it's it's I think the when you can feel like oh what was it i think bruce lee said this really wonderful thing about you know don't give your kids what you didn't have teach them the lessons that you wish you had been taught and when i read that um i actually i want to find it and put it um uh i'm going to create a website just kind of put it in there as one of the quotes because i think that that is such a wise quote you know in terms of for parenting yeah, that's very interesting. I'm going to look up that yeah. phrase. Yeah, <laughs> it's a really good quote. Yeah. Yeah, going back to what you're saying about your daughter, I actually have a family member um, that's also struggling as well to com coming out of the shell. Mm -hmm. And because Asian parents don't really typically are accepting of like... um like gays and lesbians and stuff or someone who's non-binary yeah yeah and yeah, i'm i'm non-binary as well yeah and it's just really hard because growing up i was always empathetic like i like i don't mind if they're gay or lesbian or non-binary yeah. like i think i didn't care i didn't care if they were a like, different race either mm -hmm. but for someone who's grown growing up as a very traditional conservative Asian family they are very conservative like they don't like mm -hmm. about like like anything in in particular they, they just think think that like a man and women should be together not yeah. two mans or two women two females or non-binary being together mm -hmm. and I every time whenever my dad see someone who's kind of gay who is kind of flamboyant he would like laugh like oh my god that guy's gay and i'm just like like that's not nice like, mm -hmm. like just that he's he just since it's like i guess it's not normal for him to see yeah. things and it's not nice for him to to like pick at it and and like and, and make fun of someone yeah it's like i i guess because my parents don't have that education to really like hey that's not nice mm-hmm and they carry on this traditional mindset for like a really long time. Yeah. I So what's interesting is in the San Francisco area, I, um, so I've worked in nonprofits for a long time. And there was this group that works with Asian youth. And they, they had this wonderful program um, where they had asked me to come and kind of share and um, also listen in on like what 
um, gay and lesbian and transgender youth fear in terms of, or and and or what they experience right in terms of being able to come out or not being able to come out and i remember speaking to them and saying um that i i just feel personally that as a parent you really do injustice to your child by not being accepting right because to me i mean the job of a parent is to love your child no matter how how what profession they become well sorry uh, i'll take that back the only the only thing I, i where i draw the line is murder and you know things like that and and in terms of criminal behavior um but even then i mean i feel like you know it's your child and you really want to do what you can to help them to be um positive in life and to do good things in life rather than doing bad things in life um but it's one of those things where i was really surprised and i don't know why i was surprised like not more asian parents are accepting or or make their child feel like they can come out and i feel like that's that's something that really needs to change for parents because um i i just can't imagine not loving my daughter for who she is and i i can't imagine loving her friends for who they are um she had she had this one friend in, in high school who um had not come out to his parents and i didn't want to inadvertently out him either and i remember having a conversation with her and saying like okay well if he wants to come out to his parents i'm happy to be there with him when he does like if i can offer support but i'm i'm not going to accidentally or you know try to have a conversation with her with uh, his mom or dad and try to like inadvertently out them because w- um she would go to his house and stay over and he would come to our house and stay over and i had to be very careful about the conversation i had with his mom because i couldn't say like oh i know nothing's happening because he's gay right i could say that so i had to kind of think of other ways to um just make sure that you know uh we were we had rules in our house that if she had someone in her room she always had to have the door open and same thing you know in his house and i'm sure his parents were a little nervous when she stayed over there and so um but yeah it's it's something that i wish more parents um would be open to and and would create the type of uh safe situation for their children to be able to come out Yeah, that that's very important because it's not just Asian families, it's a lot of families where mm-hmm. they're not very accepting of yeah. um, gays and lesbians and non-binary and it's it's just like you're ousting people and mm-hmm. and not really really um being generous because mm-hmm. if it was you like how, how would you feel yeah. and that's how i always grew up as like as a child like i always stepped in, into someone else's shoes mm-hmm. to to see like oh if that was me how would that feel and yeah. i think that that's a missing piece with a lot of us that we don't step in someone else's shoes mm-hmm. and we just think you know um we're kind of like selfish in a way we want to think about ourselves yeah and, but we don't really realize that if that was you what would you do yeah so it sounds like you have a very high level of empathy and compassion which is great because like that so to you it's very natural to say oh well what if i was in this other person's shoes right how would i feel and i think that's something that um you know a lot of parents are yeah they're worried they're worried about their kids they want to make sure they're making the right decisions and and i think sometimes they act in a way <clears throat> that doesn't really represent the love that they have for their kids right they act they're acting from a place of fear they're acting from a place of um you know not knowing or not having the knowledge about or just um or maybe they're acting from stereotypes that they've heard about and and so what was in, what was interesting for me after my daughter came out was i remember th- i remember thinking I kind of I had fears for her safety. You know, as someone who is gay, and I remember thinking, you know, at the same time, now is a is a great time to come out because society is changing. Society is being more embracing. Um however, 
not for everyone. Um, I, I know a lot, a lot of the transgender um, population experiences a lot of violence, experiences a lot of discrimination. Um, and that needs to change. Um, at one point in Seattle, I worked for a nonprofit organization called Youth Care, which is the largest provider for of um, homeless services for youth and young adults. And I remember being shocked hearing that about 30% of homeless youth and young adults are those who came out to their families and then the families disown them and toss them out and like literally toss them out in the streets. And I just remember being so angry about that and, and just saying like that, sorry, but that's like the got to be the stupidest thing you could, stupidest reason to toss your kid out on the street uh, for. Um, and so, so yeah, so that, that is, it is a problem that, that still needs to be addressed. Um, I'm happy to say that my daughter is working on building a career representing, um, um, gay, lesbian, and transgender authors, um, which I'm really proud of. And so it, it, but it's, it's something that I would love to see that goes beyond her, right? That we're, we're seeing more writers of different voices being published, um, and being accepted and praised for their, for their great work. Um, yeah, that's really amazing that she's, um, she's also a writer too, right? Yeah. Yeah. She got the, got your genes. <laughs> well, <laughs> I think she has her own, but I, I, I like to say that I, I influenced her. And we, I, we, we have this running joke. And the running joke is she said um, that uh, my her dad and I feel like, you know, we're great parents because we have a 100% success rate. <laughs> and I tease her and I'm like, yeah, well, you better not mess up that number. So, um, but yeah, it's one of those things where like, I am very, like I said, very proud of her for what she does. I, the, the interesting thing when she was growing up was we had two rules for her. One was, um, she couldn't be an asshole or, or jerk, uh, you know, and the other thing was she could not hurt herself or someone else. So those were the two rules. Well, actually the, the hurting part was rule number one. And so when she um, was very young. I remembered, I, I didn't want her to feel like an only child because I grew up in a family with, with, um, three other siblings. So four kids. So I remember when she was very young and we would have other kids come over and, you know, like kids always like want to grab whatever toy the other kid is playing with. She was taught that if, um, if a, a f kid who was there wanted her toy, that she could go pick another toy and then offer it up you know, and see like nine times out of the 10, whatever toy she, whatever other toy she offered up, the other kid would take. But then the one time when the kid didn't want to take it, then that's when I would be like, okay, I'm going to take this toy away. And both of you find amongst all these hundreds of toys that she has something else to play with. So what was interesting was she started to do that on her own, right? So like, instead of going and grabbing her toy out of someone else's hands, like, I was trying to teach her like you have a guest in the house and they want to play with your toy and they're here to play with you and so if you don't want them to play with that toy then you have to offer another toy um, and so it would be things like that that little things like that that I would try to teach her um, so that you know she she would learn how to share and she would learn the idea of choice yeah that's, that's really good you know that that's kind of like I feel like, you know, it's important for us, you know, who who's seen, you know, how our parents are like to to change that, to to, you know, stop that generational trauma and and like to be more aware of it. And that yeah. way like, when you pass on to the next generation, it's yeah. different. And it and, and they don't have to get to experience that same trauma that you face or or your parents faced. Yeah. I mean, I would say too, a lot of my parenting, I learned from my husband um, because what he did really well and he modeled for me was he, he treated our daughter like a person. And there would be times when um, a, a big thing when she was growing up was she never liked brushing her hair in the morning. And I would get into these big fights with her about brushing her hair before she would leave to go to school. And... Um, 
And so my husband couldn't understand, like, why am I fighting with her over this? And I, and finally he said, like, really, what, what's, what's the, what's the deeper meaning? And I said, you know, I think what it is, is like, look, if she, when she walks out the door and her hair is in knots and messy and she goes to school, no one's going to blame her. They're going to say, what mother lets her child out into, you know, to go to school with her hair like that as a mess. And so that's when he really understood, like, I I recognized it was really for my ego, not for her. And so then the rule became, um, because he would drive her to school, like we would, we would carpool with her to school. Um, so the rule was she could get into the car with her hair unbrushed, but she could not leave the car to go to school until she brushed her hair. Um, and so there was a brush in the glove compartment. So that was something that he helped me do, but it was definitely a team effort, right? And, but it, what was interesting was when I was able to recognize that it was, it was really more about me, about mom than her, then he, as, a, as my partner, was willing to support that. Right. And so that was just a very interesting. I don't know, however, uh, you know, if you had any problems with brushing your hair to go to school or if any of your listeners did. But that was a big thing in our household. And in fact, I think she wrote an essay about it in one of her uh, one of her class essays. Yes, I did. Actually, like my mom would always like, why are your hair so messy? After I wash my hair, I don't comb it. And then she go, go brush your hair. And I'm like, eh, whatever. And I just walk out the door. And just like your daughter, I don't really care. But what you, what you just said makes sense. Like, what kind of mother would let their child out the door with their hair all messy? And your, and like now it makes sense why she, why she keeps like bugging me about my hair. And I'm just like, whatever. I just walk out of the house. Like, yeah, because to you, it was your hair, you were letting it air dry, it didn't bother you, right? Like, you didn't care. And so, and I remembered when she would go to school, she would pick out her outfits, and she'd go to school with these, like, stains on her shirts, even though they were washed. And I remember thinking, all right, all right, just bite my tongue. And, you know, I there were times when I would argue with her, but then, in the end, I would let her wear what she wanted to wear, because I felt like, you know, this is really more about her asserting her her own autonomy and quite frankly all kids run around with stains on their shirts and clothing so i i had to consciously say okay may just get over it it'll be fine you know <laughs> she wasn't really being a jerk and she wasn't hurting anyone so she gets she gets a pass on that unfortunately I, I, for me i have to kind of cover what i'm wearing underneath or what whatnot because my mom like like i said mentioned earlier she's very judgmental yeah yeah judge me for what i'm wearing and she'd be like why are you wearing that outfit that's too big for you that's that looks like makes you too mature and <laughs> and i'm just like what do you want me to wear then like i like it people likes it and it, it's just her that has an opinion about everything yeah 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 well th this conversation is really great um i would like to invite you to to another podcast because we still have it seems like there's a lot of things more things to like i want to ask you sure yeah yeah i'd be happy to that would be fun yeah that's awesome well yeah. thank you for joining um me on this podcast and sharing your story